Hello ladies and gents, and welcome to The Repair Lair. In today's episode of whatever the hell it is that we do here on this channel, I'm finally addressing something that I've procrastinated about for over a year, which is modifying a third generation iPod to charge via USB. So without wasting any more time, let's get right to it. Here we have two third generation iPods. Apart from the slight differences in screen color, probably due to different revisions, they look identical. But they're not, because if I take this here USB charging brick and connect it to the iPod using a USB charging cable, well, nothing exciting happens. And that's expected, because these iPods can't charge via a 5 volt USB cable. They are meant to be charged using Firewire, which is 12 volts. However, if I plug in the second iPod, you can see that this one does, in fact, charge via USB. And now, we're going to go into great lengths as to why. The trick to charging via USB lies in this DC to DC boost converter that takes 5 volts on one side and outputs 12 volts on the other side. And this is the first item you'll need for this modification. I've added a link to the exact one I'm using here in the video description. Additionally, you'll need a spudger to open the iPod, some thin wires for connecting the converter to your iPod, a bit of electrical tape, you also need a soldering iron with accessories, and some heat shrink tubing big enough to fit the DC to DC converter. Additionally, you might want to buy a new battery and change it while you're messing with your iPod's internals. To start the modification, crack open the iPod by inserting the spudger between the plastic front and the metal back on the right side, as can be seen here. Aim to fit the spudger next to the protruding plastic clips to prevent any damage to the iPod internals. When opening the iPod, mind the audio jack connector that's still attached, and carefully unplug it using some tweezers or your spudger. Make sure to use the tweezers on the plastic part of the connector, and don't pull by the ribbon cable because it's very fragile. You can see here we've got quite a lot of space to fit the DC to DC converter. That's where it will go once we've got it connected. Next up, we need to remove the blue protective rubber from around the hard drive. The hard drive itself is connected here on the right. To remove the hard drive, carefully use the spudger to disconnect it. With the hard drive out, lift up this backing flap and disconnect the hard disk ribbon cable with your spudger. Next, remove the six star screws holding the motherboard in place. As always, make sure to keep them safe using a magnet or some kind of container. Lastly, disconnect the battery and then the display cable. The motherboard can then be removed from the front of the iPod. Here you can see the motherboard up close. We will be connecting the DC to DC converter to the following points. Ground, 12 volt firewire input, and 5 volt USB input. For ease of soldering the wires, add some extra fresh solder to the connection points as seen here. Then, solder the pre-tinned wires to the points, as shown. Make sure to put some flux on the wires for a good connection. Once finished, insert the motherboard back into the iPod and massage the cables into place as I'm doing here. The goal is to route them through the side of the battery as there is some clearance between it and the edge of the motherboard. Make sure the cables are routed between the components, so that they don't increase the motherboard thickness. Then reconnect the display cable and screw down the motherboard back in place. Once the motherboard is screwed down, finish routing the cables through these two chips on the left, as I'm doing here. 
and affix the cables in place using some electrical tape. Next, the hard disk drive backing flap and cable go back in, followed by the hard disk drive itself. I then recommend you reconnect the battery and check that everything still works correctly before proceeding further. Now we come to the converter installation. The converter has a negative and positive input pins and a positive and negative output pins. The negative pins, which are also ground in our case, are both connected together, so we only need one ground wire for both the 5 volt input and the 12 volt output. Here you can see me roughly measuring the length of wire to keep for connecting the converter. We want to keep a bit of excess length to help place the converter into the case, so don't cut the wires too short. I keep the 12 volt wire longer than the 5 volt and ground. This will allow me to have all the wires coming from the left side. These converters can typically upconvert to various voltages. Therefore, before soldering the wires, make sure the converter is correctly set up to output 12 volts by referencing this table and checking if the voltage setting pads are connected correctly. I add some solder to the contacts I'm going to be using in advance. Here I'm using a small vise to keep the converter in place while I work on it. If you don't have something like this, you can also use some double-sided sticky tape to temporarily affix the converter to your workbench. Here you can see how the solder blobs I added allow me to easily solder the wires flat, instead of inserting them through the PCB, which helps keep a low profile. Once soldered, we can reconnect the battery and test the charging. And as you can see, everything seems to be working well. You've likely noticed that we also have a power indicator LED on the converter. It's not necessary, so we remove it. We can then add a piece of heat shrink tubing on the converter to isolate it from other components. Keep in mind, you might need to tweak and trim the tubing and the wire angles a bit to make sure the converter fits well into the case. We then reattach the rubber protector over the hard disk drive. And reconnect the audio jack cable that's on the other side of the case. Finally, we aim the converter towards the empty space next to the audio jack and carefully close the case back up. If you've done everything correctly, the case should close without issues and the converter should be held in by the springiness of the cables themselves without rattling. If you can't close the case fully, check that the cables are not wedged in between the retaining clips. If the converter is rattling in the case, you can try sticking it to the back case using some double-sided sticky tape. And if you've got this far, congratulations! You now have a third-generation iPod that charges via USB. Now before wrapping up, I do want to point out that there are a few caveats in doing this modification. For starters, you need to use a powerful USB charging brick or a powerful USB port on your PC or laptop to charge the iPod with this modification. Without getting technical, the converter that we put inside the iPod actually needs quite a bit of juice to function correctly, so using something like this 500 milliamp charger here doesn't really work well. In my experience, using an inadequate charger leads to the iPod locking up upon connecting the cable, or failing to charge, or failing to even turn on with the cable plugged in. The same applies to PC and laptop USB ports. You need something that's marked as charging capable for the iPod to connect and charge and be detected properly. To put this in context, I haven't had any issues with any ports or chargers that were rated 1 amp or above, but on this laptop, for example, the standard ports, the non-charging ones, actually failed to recognize the iPod altogether. Additionally, because the 12 volt output of the converter itself 
is limited to only 500 milliamps, the iPod doesn't charge very fast, as you can imagine. But apart from those issues, I think this is a great and simple modification you can do to make using your third generation iPod much more convenient. With that said, I hope this video helps you guys to bring your old and forgotten third generation iPods back into daily use. So thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again very soon.